So David, we'll move on to the dream of our church being a serving church. Now, we know that Christ came and his ministry was to, to serve. He came to seek and to find. It was ministry of serving. How can that be translated to us as members when it comes to us serving our communities? On the individual basis, it's simply making friends with people and entering their lives and helping as and where you can and where you have permission to help. Just making friends and building up friends and being there for people. You know the story, someone faces a life crisis. Are you there for them, to help them and to support them on the way? On a more uh, corporate level, uh, we have many places of worship, for example. Beautiful places of worship, which essentially, like many Christian churches, are open only one day a week, the day of worship. What I understand from this vision for a caring church, or sorry, a serving church, is that the church becomes a place which is open, has open doors for the community. Not just as a place to worship, but a place where the, the Christ followers of that community serve others. So from a corporate level, from a church level, you mentioned individual as well, maybe the two work hand in hand before, in order for us to work effectively on a corporate level. You have to have individuals who are already showing some signs of doing that from an individual basis as well. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. So the first requirement to be a serving church is that the members of that church have a dynamic, vibrant, joyful relationship with Christ. Sure. When it comes to making friends with other people, is it not true that the more you become steeped in Adventism, that your non-Adventist friends kind of filter out and you become more associated with, your circle of friends are mostly Adventists. How do people, how can individuals break out of that to generally form meaningful relationships with people without an ulterior motive? Yeah. and getting them into the church. I'm befriending you just to get you into my church. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> but the first issue to deal with is fears and threats. The idea that if I connect with the community, my Christianity is somehow going to be neutralised or neutered or, or weakened. I'm going to become more like the community and I won't be as strong a Christian as perhaps I could be. And that's just, that's just false. Because with the example in Scripture is a fellow called Daniel, who lived uh, counterculturally to the world he lived, to the world he was taken into. And he was still remained faithful to God in an alien culture, so to speak. And that's the same for the Christian, for the Christ follower. You take Christ with you into the community and you, he, he lives in, in you and you work with him to discern right from wrong, what to do, how to behave, when to speak, how to act like he did, is there any indication from his life that he retreated? You're talking about Jesus Christ? Yes, yes. From the community, from serving people? Not at all. I mean, he retreated to recharge. Of course, yes, back. agreed. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it, for his ministry, mm. he was right there on mm. the high street, without question, mixing with people that you and I would probably be afraid to mix with because of our dis personal discomfort, right? Mm. But he took that step and said, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Um, I want to help you. Mm -hmm. Your life is a life of dross. Mm -hmm. Can I make it better? Can mm. I heal you? Mm. So it has to be authentic. Yep. It has to be out of a genuine love for people. And I think people who then can sense that you're befriending me because you, you because of your desire to know me, you, you, you want to help me in a particular yes. way, will then be, have far more um, reaching effects than you know, trying to bridge the gap very quickly. Well, you know, come along to my church and see what's going on. It's about forming those solid relationships using the model that Ellen White spoke about. Okay, I'll come to that in just a second, but I don't want to miss the point you're also trying to make, that we do not believe in calculated goodness. Mm -hmm. We will always be there for people, whatever. We expect nothing in return. We do not expect that because I help, I give you a food parcel, that you'll suddenly attend church on Sabbath. 
I give it to you because I want to genuinely help. That ought to be how it be how it ought to be. Okay, yeah. so it's a mindset. Yeah, it's a mindset. Of course, we have a burden to to help people grow and mature. We we it's inevitable that someone who has met Christ wants to invite a friend at some point at the right time to also meet mm. Christ mm. without question. Mm. But that's not the reason why I want to be kind to them, why I want to serve them. I want to serve them because of genu- I love humanity. Mm. I, I, in the name of Christ, I want to help. Mm. And if you, for whatever reason, somehow see Christ working through me or, or you see Christianity as a, attractive because of that, then praise the Lord. But any sense of um, calculated goodness is an anathema to, to what Scripture says. And let's put it like this. The litmus test is if I will continue to love you and to serve you and to help you um, uh, in perpetuity mm-hmm. without putting a deadline, uh, six months or I'm out of here. Right. That, that's wrong. Or even if they clearly say, well, you know, I like you as a person, but your faith is not something that I would like to be a part of. Will you still care for me? Will you still serve me if they make that statement? That should give us even more reason to love them. Mm-hmm. We talk about loving people into the kingdom. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Well, this is part of the discussion yeah, sure. as well. Mm-hmm. So serving corporately as a church, you now we've got some churches around the British yeah. Union that are doing some fantastic things, soup kitchens and different you know, centres and of health and so forth. These are wonderful expressions of how they're making, they're serving their community as well. Um, and we need more of that, I assume. When Elder Wilson became the, the General Commons President, uh, was it 2010, his first um, uh, tenure, term of office, he came up with the, the idea of centres of influence to help make our churches not simply centres of worship, but places where they actually serve the community. So that instead of the doors of the church only opening on one day of the week, they open every day of the week. And, and I've always been so excited about what is going on in Dublin right now, this morning as we speak, that the doors of the church are open and people are coming in for, for what is called knit and natter. They're coming in for, for s- seminars on health. They're coming in for therapeutic massage. They're coming in for counselling. They're coming in for s- to, to, to how to get rid of their stress. Uh, that, to me, seems to um, match what Jesus tried to do, mm-hmm. to make men whole, to help them, to, to just help them have life at its best. Mm-hmm. Again, unconditionally. Mm-hmm. No... no uh, there's no preconditions. Right. Yeah. You just come as you are, just enjoy. Yeah. Um, and, and it says, and that the church is a safe place to be. Mm-hmm. And I treasure that value mm. because there's so many places in society for all types of people these days are becoming unsafe. Mm. So it's a wonderful challenge then that churches or congregations that are privileged to have their own church building, uh, their churches are open more than just the Sabbath or the midweek prayer meeting but at least one or two or even three other days of the week doing something of service to the community. Yeah, um, the, the, the church in Dublin, was, it was a beautiful church, um, and 15,000 people mm. would pass by it every single day. Okay. 15,000 people mm. in that mm. suburb of Dublin. Mm. So about allowing your church to become a centre of influence yes. in the community, that's a powerful concept, and that is something which we could set the challenge for many churches, be a center of influence in your local community and let people see what you really stand for as a Christian, as a loving, serving Christian. Yes. By the way, if you haven't got a church or if, you ha- or if you're just a, say, a small church with a small group of people, I think I'd like to, like to invite you also to find places to serve. It doesn't always have to be us as a community uh, mm. creating projects and programs. Mm. Why not go and join the local uh, soup kitchen at the church down the road? Or why not join the um, a, a food bank so- group society, mm. you know, that's organised by Tesco's mm. in another part of town? Mm. Why not go on a homeless uh, soup run on a Friday night with another group of people, whatever? Mm. Just so that you can be used by God. It doesn't always have to be organised by us. Sure, sure. Well, the dream of a church being a serving church is relevant, it's important, it's imperative. 
So may that be a discussion that will take place across the churches, even as they read the Messenger editor, editorial, and something that we will plan to purposely um, put into practice individually and as a church.